they build walls to keep us out of original lands, and if that fails to stop us, then they'll just poison our water. And that's where we're at. Whether it's Flint, Michigan last year, where the governor's still free, when they poison an entire town, or what's happening in North Dakota right now with Standing Rock Nation and no um, D DPL. And for a newer generation of people who are on the front lines doing the work, this new iteration of movement is framed as a civil rights movement. But this is not about civil rights because laws have obviously not protected us. Because even though some of us have American citizenship, we are not treated as Americans, right? This is a movement for our humanity and our very existence. It's not about public policy or how many laws are on the books. So when we're talking about fighting for justice, people do not like what they view to be a radical militancy, but we're not really even there when you study movements. But the idea that we have to say Black Lives Matter under a black president and that people get mad that we say Black Lives Matter, I would be very afraid about what would happen when people stop saying Black Lives Matter and just rebel out and out in this country and uprise everywhere because we've seen it, Ferguson, Baltimore, and Charlotte in less than two years. And a new generation of unapologetic, unrespectable, in your face, or as they say in Ferguson, the whole damn system is guilty as hell young people. People don't like that. Right, because they're showing us literally through their words and actions what is wrong with this militarized police force in America. And Ferguson is always critical to remember because even though we're in the historical moment of Black Lives Matter, Ferguson led the rebellions in this country. And Ferguson, a very small city, right, with mostly queer, young, homeless, marginalized people led that rebellion. It wasn't college students, it wasn't the political class, it wasn't the political elites, it wasn't the ministers, the priests and all that. It was these young people. And when they got on those streets to protest the killing of Mike Brown, they were met with a militarized police force that many of us knew existed since we live in a post 911 world, but we had not seen. And if you're not a study of history and particularly looked at footage of the 60s of military tanks in black cities in the, the late 50, or the, the mid 60s, or maybe you didn't even know about the Rod Rodney King Rebellion, where LA burned for almost 10 days um, post the acquittal of the officers who beat Rodney King. They, people look at it and go, I don't understand why they're so angry. I don't understand why they would burn their own community down, right? And it's like, you don't understand that they were, mess with, they were met with MRAPs and tear gas and pepper spray and drones and rubber bullets for standing out in the street, throwing rocks at tanks. And those first couple of days of the Ferguson Rebellion, the most international solidarity came from the young people at Pal of Palestine who were like, well, first, that pepper spray they're using is the same pepper spray they use here, so this is what you need to do to protect yourself. And second, sending messages of solidarity via, via social media. So Black Lives Matter was a hashtag that started when Patrice, Alicia, Patrice Culler, Alicia Garza, and Opal Tometi could not believe in their generation couldn't believe that George Zimmerman could walk out of the courthouse after he murdered Trayvon Martin, right? So each generation, something happens to move them to, to something. And that's what Black Lives Matter has been doing, but not just Black Lives Matter as a hashtag, Black Lives Matter 
as a movement, as a national network. The larger way that it's called is, is the movement for black lives. And that's important to realize because under that, there are so many different organizations, right? So whether it's Ferguson or Leaders of a Beautiful Struggle in Baltimore, Dream Defenders out of um, Florida, Black, BYP 100 that does this specific work through what they call or what they say is a queer feminist lens coming out of Chicago, and the Malcolm X, and, and precursors to all of these, well, the Malcolm X Grassroots Movement, an organization that I've been part of for almost 20 years, to Cooperation Jackson in Mississippi, that is literally looking and, and doing people's assemblies and self-determining how they're gonna run their city. These are critical things to know about the movement. Because in the last two years, a lot of young, people of color as well as white young people have been jolted out of a false narrative of a post-racial society. Post the uh, Obama election, right? You know, all these discussions about a post-racial society. Well, you can't have a post-racial society until white supremacy is dead. But we have to then also look at how our young people have been educated right, and what kind of schools they've gone to, whether they're good schools or bad schools, we do know that for at least a decade, young people have been going to schools where they're taught not to critically think, not to engage, and are taught to take a test. And then we expect young people at 18 to all of a sudden be politically astute. It's like, so you've been telling them how to be and act and think for eight years and then in six months, they're supposed to be critical thinkers and great writers and how is that possible when they've been so socialized to only answer and learn what literally is gonna be on a test, right? And that runs the gamut, whether the young person is never gonna be in school or the young person is not gonna be able to work, or the young person is gonna be in college, they've all gone through this kind of socialized, standardized testing process, right? So then what often happens is we have the reaction to the violence that's being perpetrated. And when people, when Black Lives Matter as a hashtag then grows, because of Ferguson and the other rebellions that happened last year, including right what happened in Milwaukee recently, right? This idea is that when we say Black Lives Matter, we're also seeking to reclaim the truth of our condition. And what is that truth when it comes to Black lives in America and throughout the world? Here I use Black more broadly. So I'm talking about Black lives in America, whether you're Puerto Rican, Dominican, Honduran, I mean, most, if people from Central America, they'll probably say, I'm indigenous, right? But you're still mostly African descendant. But there's many reasons we as Latinos are not taught that history or ever told that. But this idea of black lives, right? Whether they're in Gainesville, Florida, or the Bronx, Dominican Republic, Haiti, Colombia, Panama, Palestine, or France. We have to ask what the truth, we have to understand what the truth of our condition is and then our position, right? And the truth of the condition of most of our community is that more than half will never have the opportunity to step onto any college campus. The truth that our bodies not only labor for 500 years for free to build, not America, to build the world, that our bodies have also been abused, experimented on, right? That doesn't change. So whether we're in college, on the block, on the stool, the bodega, defending our dissertation, if we don't understand the systemic violence and systemic racism right, then we continue to be subjugated. And from the time many of us come out of our parents' wombs, we are targets and no amount of degrees or respectability has ever saved us. But what has saved us is truth telling 
intellectual rigorousness, scholar activism, and hopefully building an intense love for your people. Those of us who get to these institutions never get here alone. Therefore, we are not here for ourselves. That may be viewed as a burden to some people, but to me, that's how we honor our ancestors. That's how we honor our elders, because they are the reason that we're here, as well as struggle. Look, none of these colleges wanted us. They were forced to take us in, right? either through affirmative action programs, minority recruitment programs, five, many, many programs, but mostly because black and Latino and other students of color were protesting these institutions and they were forced to open the doors and let us in. And in fact, during the height of student protests in this country to open the doors, a lot of people who fought for us to be here never stepped foot in a college. So you had a lot of people in the black power movement who were protesting on these campuses and they never wanted to be here. But they knew that these institutions were acting out of racism by not allowing us to be here, right? And that's what movement does. It's not that you're gonna get the individual win, it's what First, how do we hold power and institutions accountable, but that the history of how even we get to these campuses, we're often not told. So then we have generations of people that think, I just did it on my own. No, you probably did, but really, you're here because there was a movement that kicked open those doors. To me, that doesn't mean that you owe any system or institution a thank you. As I said, most of these institutions were forced to let us in. But it does mean that the time you spend here should be spent on not trying to get through this and get a diploma to secure a job or put it on your resume. Time in college should do what I said before, all the critical thinking and all that, but it should ultimately make you an organizer or that you're gonna use your scholarship to better the conditions in your community, whatever that scholarship is. You're gonna be a lawyer, then don't be a corporate lawyer for oil companies. You're gonna be a doctor, then be a doctor and then also try to open up a free clinic, right? Or you're gonna be a, a, a teacher in the medical field, then talk about bias and racist, um, racism in the medical field, right? Talk about the fact that when black people say they're in pain, doctors don't tend to believe them. Those are very real things. But it shows that anything we choose to do as what we have to do work-wise, right? That we have to always understand that there is something that we can do to break racism within that discipline, right? So for many students right now, even on the most elite campuses, they feel under siege. They feel not listened to. They feel not just microaggressions, but macroaggressions not passive racism, in your face racism. I'm talking about the most elite schools, right? Just in general, last year there were over 1,000 protests all over these college campuses where students of color were demanding administrations leave because they're not responding to the needs of the students, right? So, what we have to do as students of color when we arrive to these campuses is that, and people often say this is isolationist, oh, you're self-segregating. No, no, I'm not self-segregating when I'm the minority in numbers. I'm not self-segregating when I'm demanding that in my English department you teach black literature, that black literature is not only taught in black studies. No, I'm not demanding anything but equity when I'm looking at judicial processes that discipline us more than they discipline white students who do the same thing on college campuses, right? I know this, not only as an educator, but I've been traveling to campuses the whole year. And this is all that students of color are telling me. They feel they don't belong. They feel isolated. They feel whatever they do is not good enough. And they feel they have to answer every question for everything around racism, right? And that, that essentially is not what the college experience should be like. But given that, I believe that's what makes strong people, 
right? Like that kind of, uh, you get a little grit and fortitude. But in order to get that grit and fortitude, you also have to have like very real information, right? And you have to understand what things are looking like. So I talked about that statistic before, but look, 65% of African American and Latino children currently live in poverty. Student debt is $1.4 trillion. People are fighting for a $15 livable wage, which is actually not a livable wage in a lot of cities. Gentrification has made affordable housing almost impossible. And this generation will have less home ownership than any previous generation, right? We're at a time where I've said this statistic a lot, but we did this report in 2012 through the Malcolm X grassroots movement where we documented that an African-American person is killed every 28 hours or less in this country by the police. If you add Latinos and Native Americans, that's every 14 hours. As well, a transgender woman of color's life expectancy is 35, right? We also had a time where the Latino community is the reason President Barack Obama won his second term and he rewarded that by increasing deportations and ICE raids in our communities, right? And a lot of times when we have the conversation about immigrant rights, we talk a lot about the dreamers. And the DREAM Act is a good act, but what it did was give preference to a certain class of undocumented person. Now, that doesn't mean that I don't believe every dreamer should have that. No, because they fought for that. But what it did is set up a narrative in the mainstream media and our communities that these are good undocumented people and the only people we're deporting is criminals. And that's not true, right? That's not true. But it even, and, and actually you see why the DREAM Act and a lot of the movement leaders in the DREAM Act got co-opted by the Democratic Party and why you've had an, a, a radical movement that broke from the, dream, the dreamers and that kind of public policy movement. And you've had um, Not One More and Mi Gente, a newer kind of pro-black, pro-Latinx, pro-queer organization forming, right? I mean, because a lot of Latinos were like, he's gonna reward us. And it's like, yeah, by being the deporter in chief which is what he is in our communities, right? And as a Puerto Rican, I don't have, I don't, in our community, we don't have to deal with being undocumented, but as a Puerto Rican, I'm always telling folks, especially older folks, like, yo, the immigrant rights struggle is our struggle too. <laughs> like, don't get that twisted, right? And also, public education in this country has been effectively destroyed, right? Especially if you're from a poor community. The, the, the flip side of all this is, this is the historical moment of Black Lives Matter. And in that, there's also a generation of Latinx, South Asian, Native young people that are no longer willing to be passive, they're not willing to sit, they're not willing to be quiet, and are pushing back through movements. So essentially, we are witnessing history in the making, right? And either you're part of history or you end up reading about it in a book. I don't want to read about it in a book. I never wanted to read about just history in a book, especially when I could be part of it. And then in the last year, we've been subjected to this presidential horror reality TV show, right, where we have candidates that for a year were calling people rapists and murderers and anchor babies saying that particularly undocumented people should be tracked like FedEx packages and that all black community needs is law and order, right? And then we've seen more and more killings. And this is where we're at. But again, there are so many people doing so much work out there Right, and there's so many people who are doing movement work, but in order to do the work, you have to be part of an organization. You cannot be an individual and think that you're gonna make any significant change unless you're part of an organized force, right? And being part of that will then give the keys to fight 
and demand for justice. This idea of justice has now have to be a communal responsibility. It has to be part of our culture, our DNA, and our daily lives. Racial and racist discontent will continue to show up more and more in a country where particularly white male identity is a fragile identity. It's crazy, right? But I don't necessarily think that every Trump supporter is a racist. See, what I'm seeing when I see some Trump supporters, right, is that they're so economically depressed and oppressed. And then usually in, when you study history, what you end up seeing is that working people turn on working people, right? But particularly, this white nationalist fervor, it's been solidified with Donald Trump, but it had been building since Obama had been elected to be president. So what I'm saying is that a lot of this is not new. What is often new is how we take in the information and what we choose to do with it and what, how we choose to do work against injustice, right? And how we choose to do that work especially when we do enjoy privileges. Many people that we know in general, regardless of ethnicity and race, are just struggling to get by at this point. Many people are spending their paycheck on just rent right now, right? And then what about all our people that have suffered under 40 years of mass incarceration and their inability to ever re-enter society? So the work is not easy, right? And sometimes I know with younger folks will say, but it's not fair, we have to do. No, it's not fair, right? But we don't live in that type of society. We gotta always remember and have historical memory and think what would Harriet, what did Harriet say? What did Sojourner say? What did Nat Brown say? What did um, Malcolm say? What did Shirley Chisholm say? Like, what was Fannie Lou doing? What was Ida B. Wells Barnett doing, right? Ultimately, all of them were about self-determination and how we, as a community, have to have the human, the, the, the ability to self-determine the faith of our own communities, right? I don't have faith in institutions changing things. My ultimate faith lies in people power, in people speaking truth to power, acting against power, and resisting at every turn until we win. That's a social justice lens that I employ, and one that fights for full freedom every step of the way. We are gonna take many more losses in this movement work. But that revolutionary fervor or that faith, right, is what Du Bois, W.E.B. Du Bois talked about. And he talked about in one of his books how every day he woke up committed to striking a hammer to the system of white supremacy. Whether it was through speaking out, through writing, through acting, to starting an organization, starting the NAACP, then leaving it because even back then he was like, oh no. This is not gonna get us freedom, but I helped start it, so now you run with it. But he talked about that. And we also have to reckon with the fact that we have to stop the madness of a hyper-masculine, hyper-militarized capitalist society. Because ultimately, that's why we're in the mess that we're in. We're in a hyper-masculine, hyper-militarized, hyper-capitalist society. And what Black Lives Matter has done, and a lot of younger people on the ground, is say that we're not looking at just an individual act of racism anymore. We're looking at how we systemically attack this from the bottom to the top, the top to the bottom, try to transform society, even if we fail, but try to turn everything upside right. So if you're gonna do the work, it doesn't have to be something huge every day. You can't do something big every day, but every day you could do something. 
For a lot of us, this is not just a trend, a Snapchat, a hashtag, a t-shirt, or a button. I know people who have literally put their lives on the line. I've seen people die putting their lives on the line. I've seen international movements of particularly women and organizers be killed for unionizing their, their town in, 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 you know, in Ecuador or in Honduras against land grabs. We've seen this in Brazil right now, the crackdown on the afro descendants movements is something we haven't seen, but it, it, it makes sense since they ousted the democratically elected woman president and replaced it with an all white male government. But the crackdown on African descendants in Brazil is something they haven't seen in over 30 or 40 years. And that's the last thing I wanna end with, that the work we do is international, that just because you live in the United States of America, well, first, it doesn't mean that we're doing all the movement work on point. And you know, we have to see what's happening on the continent of Africa, in Latin America, in Greece, and what just happened in Iceland last week. We even have to see how young people reacted to Brexit. We have to see how refugees are fighting back all over this country, to, uh, all over the world. You have to see yourselves outside of the borders of the United States. We live in a borderless society for most tents and purposes, especially through communication. But often, we get so caught up in what is wrong in America that we, realize some, we, some, we have to realize some of the problems in America would be some problems that people would be asking for in other countries. You're talking about a billion people without water, clean water a day. We talk about police brutality here in Brazil is six African descendants are killed by the police every day. The crisis in Puerto Rico right now, where less than two months ago the island was without electricity for 80, or 80% 80 of the island was out, for, out of electricity and people are like, oh, Puerto Ricans can't, they don't have their house in financial order. No, no, colonialism is why that's happening in Puerto Rico. United States imperialism is that's why it's happening in Puerto Rico, right? We have to see what the rest of the world is doing. And that often the rest of the world does look, particularly to black and brown movements in this country, to gauge what we're doing against the beast. The American government that is militarizing or, or waging war all over this world. You have to understand what's going on in Syria. That's not just something happening over there. You have to understand what the Palestinian people are living under and have been living under. You have to question a government that continues, our government continues to fund the state of Israel at more dollars than we fund public education, that this country spends $600 billion a year on war, and then we'll tell students we can't pay off or forgive your student loan debt. We can spend trillions of dollars bailing out Wall Street hedge fund operators, but we can't bail out people whose homes are in foreclosure. We can talk about how great this country is, but we don't have clean water. If that pipeline is built, 15 million people's water could be affected and they say pipelines never burst. Well, one just did, the colonial one. And ultimately, this is what young people are struggling for worldwide. How are we dealing with climate change at this level? And that climate change, Naomi Klein has talked about in Bill McKibben. She says, we now require radical militancy that we've never seen before. We don't know what it looks like, but if we're even going to save a little bit of this planet, what is now required is not going to conferences and having public policy meetings, but shutting down the system to the point where it cannot function unless it responds to the people's needs. So I'll end with the words of Frederick Douglass. Let me give you a word of the philosophy of reforms. The whole history of the progress of human liberty shows that all concessions yet made to her august claims have been born of earnest struggle. The conflict has been exciting, agitating, all absorbing, and for the time being, putting all other turmoils to silence. It must do this or it does nothing. 
If there is no struggle, there is no progress. Those who profess to favor freedom and yet depreciate agitation are men and women who want crops without plowing up the ground. They want rain without thunder and lightning. They want the ocean without the roar of its many waters. The struggle may be a moral one, moral one or it may be a physical one, and it may be both moral and physical, but it must be a struggle. Power can seize nothing without a demand. It never did and it never will. Find out just what any people will quietly submit to and you have found out the exact measure of injustice and wrong which will be imposed upon them. And these will continue till they are resisted with either words or blows or with both. The limits of tyrants are prescribed by the endurance of those whom they oppress. And then our Black Lives Matter quote is an Asada Shakur quote. And it says, it is our duty to fight for our freedom. It is our duty to win. We must love and protect each other. We have nothing to lose but our chains. Palante siempre, palante. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you so much. So now we will begin our question and answer, question and answer section. Um, so does anyone have any questions? So yeah, I'm willing to now talk about the election. I didn't want to spend any time on that in the speech, so you know, feel free. I'm sure there are questions about that. I got it. Yeah, yeah. Go ahead, Yeah, <laughs> yeah go ahead. Um, you know, I think for me, mostly, it's been, I'm very uh, open and real about um, the struggles of being, you know, an organizer, like, you know, whether it's for years not making any money, you know, struggling financially. Um, I think a lot of us who do this movement work deal with depression. I mean, I think people in general deal with that, but I think in the movement it's heightened and you could go through super highs and super lows. Um, you know, I think you have to realize that not everyone in the movement you're gonna be friends with, doesn't mean you can't organize with them. Um, and that repression is, is always around the corner when you're doing the work. So how do you protect yourself? What's your crew? What's your communication strategy? Like all that kind of stuff. But 